evening. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives on Thursday, February 4th, 2021. And I am delighted to uh, welcome Amanda Garces uh, here today, who is the chair of the Ethnic Studies and Social Equity Work Group um, related to Act One that we passed in 2019. And um, you have submitted a report uh, to the legislature and we are delighted to hear from you uh, to inform the committee on, on your progress. Welcome. Great, thank you so much, Representative Webb. Um, uh, so Amanda Garces, I'm also the Director of Policy Education and Outreach for the Vermont Human Rights Commission. Um, really happy to be here. This committee uh, really was who helped us um, get to where we are today. So I just wanna acknowledge that. I'm gonna do a little uh, presentation. I know that um, people are new to the committee. So I just want to give a little overview of, of Act One and where we are today. And can everybody see the screen? Yes, yes good. So just to to give a little bit of background around Act One and its genesis, um, the act, um, so in 1999, the Vermont Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights published a report um, titled Racial Harassment in Vermont Public Schools and described the state of racism in our schools. So it basically said that racism in Vermont school was pervasive. In 2003, there were uh, it was a follow-up report with some changes um, that you know still alluded to the fact that racism still existed. And one of the many problems highlighted at the time uh, was that some curriculum materials and lesson plans promoted racial stereotypes. And the conclusion was that there was a need for a bias-free curriculum. Um, in December 2006. 17 Act 54 report on racial disparities in state systems also alluded um, to the issues in education in terms of racial disparities. And many reports subsequent to that have uh, shown the disparities uh, for uh, students of color, students with disabilities, and from the LGBTIQ systems, um, you know, not disproportionately impacted by policies, disciplines, and uh, things of that sort. I'll be happy to, I think in the report we, uh, in the act itself, there's like some of those reports highlighted. So I put this picture of uh, Paige Wiley Bailey. I never met her, but I've heard so many great things about her. And um, she's one, one of many people who really have been working towards racial justice in our Vermont schools. Paige had a 24 hour, seven day a week hotline that she answered by herself when families of color will have issues at school and she was one of the advocates. So I, I just wanna have that just to say that there's so much work that for decades have been done around this, this work. So in 2018, um, the, um, the first ethnic studies bill was introduced by representative, uh, then representative Kaya Morris, Representative Coach Christie, um, Representative Brian Tina, and others. Uh, and it did not pass, but it gathered enough consensus among the institutions that included the Agency of Education, School Board Association. Uh, the bill did not pass that year, but it was the first um, in 2019 to pass thing uh, for this committee that did a lot of work to make it happen. And uh, it was signed in March 2019. The act, what it does is creates an ethnic and social equity standards advi advisory working group composed of 20 people, um, uh, many from the education institutions that you hear from every day. Um, 11 members have been appointment, appointed by uh, an organization called the Vermont Coalition for Ethnic and Social Equity in Schools, which I am part of as well, um, but that uh, appointed the people. There was a process of interviews, an application process, and the, the 11 members, including two students and one member from the Abenaki, um, uh, are, are, you know, went through a whole process. So uh, the working group is tasked to look at the state board rules and regulations, like the standards, 
and to rec to rec and update them or uh, make recommendations to um, fully look at the history contributions and perspectives of ethnic and social groups. We also are tasked to review state statutes, state board rules, and school district and supervisory union policies that concern or impact the standards for student performance. So those are two big jobs. Our first meeting was in November, 2019. We met for the first time and then um, quickly COVID happened and we couldn't meet anymore. So this is the picture when we were used to be all together. <laughs> so we had one meeting and then we, um, when I, I we went to, to Zoom, um, we were a little delayed because we started this process later. Um, uh, in May 29, we submitted our first report that just was just, here's the membership of the group, the meeting schedule and what we were gonna do. And then we also announced the development of an educational standard survey document, which is a tool we created um, to help us look at how to look at the standards. Um, this tool is right now in survey format and we're being, um, we're sending it out to all the educators and I can send you a link afterwards. Um, to look at you know, how they view the current uh, education standards. And um, I can share that with you. So once the survey is done from the educator perspective, there's a group of people who will be doing the same, translating that to a caregiver's parents survey, and then another one for students who will be uh, developed to get feedback about what they're thinking is. January 4th, we just submitted a report and in the report, we are doing, giving our first recommendation to the state board to look at the education quality standards. The education quality standards, uh, it's, it describes what a high quality education should look like for students attending our Vermont public schools. And so we're making significant recommendations for them. One of them is to mandate some ethnic and social equity uh, in school pre-K to grade 12, establishing and supporting local school community committees to shape the development of those practices, promoting restorative and transformative justice programs, um, develop and fund professional development and mentoring programs for school staff, um, broaden the prohibit, prohibition of bias and discriminatory treatment to include um, ethnic, caste, socioeconomic status, non-citizenship status, language and linguistic abilities, and then integrating career and vocational training into the ethnic studies uh, pedagogy. Additionally, we are uh, in the report, we are exploring some other initiatives. Um, one is the, oh, wait, I have to, this, in the, in the, I know that there's a lot of conversations around literacy right now. Um, there is a team in our working group uh, headed by Infinite who, is, uh, who works for Voices for Vermont Children um, and who was appointed by the coalition. And he is with a team of three people who was looking at literacy through the lens of ethnic studies and like the disparities that exist for BIPOC students right now. So that, that is on the works also. Um, so we're, we're looking at a lot of the questions that are coming up from the working group is um, the license, licensure and field work requirements for future educators, pre-K through grade 12 and how they are um, getting trained to be in this world of uh, racial injustice. Uh, the um, adopt, adoption of policies on racial justice, social equity, and, and diversity hiring by school boards, which uh, there's also teams of people who are kind of like thinking around that. Uh, no work has started around that. Um, some of the things that we're thinking about is like, for, you know, recommending formal evaluation of the flex flexible pathways initiatives of 2003 in relationship with the historically marginalized students. And then um, a big one is the establishment of a professional development collaborative with the College of Ethnic Studies in San Francisco. So that is one of the, 
The College of Ethnic Studies in San Francisco was established in 1969. It's one of the oldest. Um, they are, uh, their field is unique, you know, as an educational experience. And um, from their website, it says it redefines the lives of people of color from their own perspective. And this is like, so um, we have been since June uh, speaking with the Dean of the college, uh, speaking with two uh, amazing professors who are nationally, internationally acclaimed. Uh, they're really amazing. They work with many school districts in the nation. They do talks. Um, and we've been thinking of a collaboration to support this work here in Vermont. Um, so that, that, that is one of the projects that we, we have been working on. And I think their expertise is what we need to move this part of the work. I'm almost done. Um, so other projects we're working on, we're looking at you know, the reviewing of the Title 16 statues that are uh, among our purview that there's a team, a subcommittee that's looking at that. Um, and the way that we're thinking about is like getting the feedback from the communities that and the schools. Um, subcommittee exploring avenues of advising and supporting local school boards for the policies. We had the school board association come and give a presentation in our last meeting. So we're thinking about that. Um, the literacy committee, which I already spoke about. And then the survey that we're doing, the collaboration with the coalition um, to make sure that the work is being, you know, like really on the ground that people are listening and like that we're getting feedback from the communities um, in Vermont so that it's not just us. And then we've been talking with the, the Vermont, Principals, Vermont Principals Association and some of the work that they're doing and then uh, these we requested in the last session, but because of COVID, we couldn't follow through. But we are um, currently requesting the additional three members, two more students, and one indigenous um, representative, which is really key. A student voice is really um, is really important. They advocated for those two seats, and then in our first meeting, they advocated for two more. And their perspective is so valuable and so needed right now that um, like centering their voices is really key for our working group. So with that, we end by asking for $108,000 um, of appropriations for this work. I wanna know that this has been a lot of work that is done, um, you know, week by week. Um, so we're asking for 25, thousand dollars to work with a national specialist we really don't we don't we think we 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 know that we need support in all the standards when mark and i uh started working on them over the summer you know it, it's gonna be like we need some expertise uh to come in to help us analyze how to move the work forward um seventy one thousand dollars for this work to really be effective we're hoping to start that relationship with that, the College of Ethnic Studies to do a 30 Vermont educator uh, cohort um, that can be recruited by people that are educators that are already doing the work um, in the schools to enroll in a three credit course of College of Ethnic Studies in San Francisco, hoping that they can become trainers too and to start to you know, grow um, their work. Um, we also, you know, we have um, folks in our, well, we all need to have this information accessible, right? Like the statues is not, you know, easy to read. All the standards are dry. All of that knowledge is really hard. Even month to month when I'm doing the, the reports that I'm sending or like the things that the subcommittees are working, what that requires having, sort of tra trying to translate this document to accessibility for our, you know, like um, our communities with disabilities. Um, and, and that is not an easy task. I've actually been failing at that quite regularly because it's not, you know, it's not my expertise to be, to be trying to 
make um, the language more accessible. And it should be all of our expertise, but it's not. And so we want, we'd like to hire someone to support in that, to make all these concepts more accessible to the communities that we're working with. And then at last, you know, $2,000 for technology costs. Well, actually that $1,500 is for the stipend for the three members that were requested. And then 500 is just for all the technology costs, the survey monkey, for example, and paying out of pocket, you know, like things like that come out. I'm committed to this, but you know, it's like, we, we need some support on that. Zoom, all of this uh, to make it more accessible for people. So that is uh, that. And this is this money here that you were referring to was um, all uh, one-time money, correct? It's all correct. just it's all just for your one-year budget. Correct. Okay. And did anybody put that into a bill form? Yes. Um, Representative Brian China and Representative okay. Coach uh, just made it. I don't think has been released yet, uh, but. Uh, like uh, they just did it yesterday or like they did it last week. And okay. I think, um, yes. So I, as soon as I have the number. Okay. And um, yeah, I would say that there is an incredible amount of work that has been done um, and that the working group is working. Excellent. Um, questions, Representative Brady. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, does the legislation that they are working on include the two additional student positions? Like, is that something we would have to legislate? And has anybody drafted that? Yeah, it's part of that bill um, okay. because it, there is appropriation to add three more people of fifteen hundred dollars uh, and. And we didn't really spend the 15,000 last year. As of the report of January, we still had $14,000 because, you know, we're not paying stipend, we're right. not paying mileage or, you know, just, we, we're just paying the $50 stipends and not everybody's actually have taken, are taking it, so. Okay, and then this, uh, my second question might be more of a, a question for you, Chair Webb, but, so when the recommendations come out and if there are changes to the EQS, is that totally a state board thing or is there a legislative role in that? I believe it's that state, oh, I don't know. Oh, sorry, <laughs> not for me, good question. I, I have to get counsel on that, but I believe that the standards are um, addressed at the State Board of Education. We can ask them to develop standards. Um, but whether we would have to do that or not, I'm not sure if it's it just okay. goes directly to them and they'll consider it. But we did, we did, uh, we were, we did sort of do a flurry of trying to get those two students in and it was just too crazy at the end of the year. So mm -hmm. I, I think we're, I think there's a lot of interest in taking that up this year. Thank you, Representative Webb. Yeah. And we are reporting, we are doing a presentation to the state board on their upcoming meeting in February, in a few weeks. So. Um, that conversation is starting as well. Represent Representative Austin. Yes, thank you. Um, Amanda, I just have a couple of uh, kind of process questions. The survey that's being sent out to the teachers, is that um, before you um, start looking at, you know, where you want to build on standards or uh, increase uh, standards, is that, are you going to wait and kind of synth synthesize the results of that survey so you can see what is already being taught and then build on that or see where the gaps are? That, yeah, that's okay. one question. And then I have one more question. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. I can. And the other question is just the 71,000 for the 30 teachers, couldn't that be taken out of their professional development funding? Mm-hmm. So for the second question, that is how we're only asking for half and we're committing to look through other resources for what the, the full program, I believe it's like 150. And so the other, the other part of the funding, we're looking to their maybe PD credits, but also partnering with other um, 
or other agencies and organizations in Vermont that can support the subsidize the other half of the cost for those 30 teachers. Thank so you. Uh, we're not asking for the full amount of the, what the cost will be. And just about the standards, just the time of the survey. Yeah. Yeah, so the survey, um, so when we started, we, we created a tool that said, you know, like, it, like we had a, a standards that really look at centering or not centering, but not, like really looking at what we're trying to accomplish, which is like having uh, BIPOC students not be marginalized. Like, so we created a tool um, and then we said, well, we can use this and see like if the current standards have that. So that, so that is what we're asking is like, um, and I can send you the survey. Uh, my brain is not completely there to recite the survey right now, but um, the, you know, some of the questions is like those, uh, the educational standards that you use, and it you know, depends each teacher has uses different um, center, you know, like they, do they talk about ableism? Do they center, do they talk about I don't know, slavery. And so like it, it just, and then it gives them. So I can say, I'll be more than happy to send the survey so that you can also send them to your constituent educators uh, to fill out surveys. It's taking about 15, 20 minutes. Okay. I think my question, my um, question is, are you going to- Representative wait? Austin, Representative Austin, well, I've only got about four more minutes and I have two more people that want to, want to talk. Perhaps you and, and Amanda could talk offline. Is that possible, Amanda, for you to talk? Thank you. Yeah. Representative Brown. Oh, thank you. I just have a very quick question. Amanda, you had mentioned someone who was specifically doing um, this work um, focusing on literacy. Can you just repeat that name for me? Yes, it's Infinite Code Closure, and I can send you the email. He's one of our subcommittee members. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Representative James. Thank you. Um, I was interested to see that you're going to explore um, the intersection of historically marginalized students and flexible pathways. So if, if that's a long answer, um, no need to respond, but I, I was just curious what you're expecting to find or why that's an area of interest for you. Um, yes, I, I think we're just looking at the programs and how um, we want to make sure that BIPOC students are taking advantage of these programs um, to the full extent and, and that it, it's working for them as well. So like we know that sometimes uh, programs like that are inaccessible for a variety of reasons. Um, so we want to make sure that they that all those variety of reasons are taken into account. So thank you. It's a, it was the beginning. So we're just starting. OK. Thank you so much. Representative Brown, is that, um, that's not a new question. Is that a new question? No, okay. Thank you so much. Um, we will, I'll be watching either, I'll either be watching for uh, Representative Chena's bill or we'll just, we'll just pick it up. Uh, we are going to be uh, making some recommendations to the budget anyway, um, and we'll keep that in mind. Thank you so much for your time, and it was great seeing you again. One quick, quick question, Amanda. Is there anything in there that you've addressed on implicit bias training? Um, in, there, in the EQS, there is, there is a little, but not, like, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thank I'm you. sure we'll see you again. Yes. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thank you.